You know, we talk a lot about influencer marketing software on this show. And the worst thing about it for a lot of you is that influencer marketing software for small businesses is too expensive, right? Well, Reach Influencers solves that problem. Now your small business can find, engage, and manage micro and nano influencers, the ones you can afford to work with. And Reach Influencers costs as low as $100 per month. Are you kidding me? No, it's true. Go to CaptureTheInfluence.com slash podcast and see for yourself. Find, engage, manage, influence with software built and priced for your sized business. CaptureTheInfluence.com slash podcast on this episode of Winfluence. It's no different than your cost of a customer in any business. Ads are sold on a CPM basis. The industry average right now is about $25. I have 365 shows that I produce a year, and that is roughly one third of a thousand. That means a subscriber who listens to all your shows in a year will be listening to a third of a CPM, which is about $8 something. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls, and in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. This is episode 178 or so of Winfluence. I don't typically count or even add the episode number to the shows because I've always thought episode numbers were more of an internal cataloging system for the podcaster and listeners don't really care. I keep track, but it's easier to just search for the guest or topic on my website or even the podcast apps than to have to remember numbers. I mean, thanks to mobile phones, who has brain capacity to remember numbers anymore? But I call out episode 178 today because this episode is the first with a repeat guest. Gary Arndt joined us in January of 2021 to talk about becoming influential via a podcast. He's the host of Everything Everywhere Daily. That daily dose of history and trivia launched when the pandemic wiped out Gary's other business. He was a travel and tourism blogger, photographer, and podcaster. His industry shut down thanks to COVID. Gary was out of job and out of income. He didn't have anything to do, so he threw himself into starting a podcast, but running it like a business. He very quickly went from in the red to in the black. When we last spoke, Gary was hitting around 60,000 downloads per month. That was about six or eight months into his new venture. He now has more than 10 times that in terms of monthly downloads. By the end of this year, he will likely hit 1 million monthly downloads downloads. And Gary is one man researching and writing one show per day from his basement. He's an independent podcaster. Us indie folks don't typically hit 1 million downloads in a year, much less a month. Today, we revisit Gary Arndt, who tells us the lessons he's learned from trying everything, testing, iterating, and climbing his way from zero to hero in the podcasting space. He shares the best methods to grow and a little of where his show has taken him that he didn't expect. A lot of the advice Gary has for us correlates to growing your influence on social networks. But if you're keenly interested in podcasting and getting specific advice on how to go big or go home, get ready to take some notes. Before we dive into that conversation, we've got a couple new show sponsors I want you to know about. The first helps me create this podcast. The second helps me stay organized and keep work moving for my clients. Did you know that I record the interviews you hear here on Winfluence with Zencaster? I do. And I have used it for quality audio recording over the internet for years now. Today's interview with Gary Arndt was done on Zencaster. Zencaster builds itself as an all-in-one podcast production suite that gives you studio quality audio and video without needing all the technical know-how. Here's why it works so well. It records each guest locally. The file is saved to their computer. Then it uploads the crystal clear audio and video right into a cloud folder and the Zencaster suite so you have high quality raw materials to work with. Stop recording one track in Zoom and other software. Do it the professional way. And I've scored a discount for you. Winfluence listeners get 30% off a pro account. There's also a free trial so you can test it before you commit. Just go to zen.ai slash winfluence. That's Z-E-N dot AI slash winfluence. Take your podcast recordings, video and audio to the next level. Sound good, just like me. Zen.ai slash winfluence. 
And if you're wondering how I keep all my work organized for this podcast and all the influence marketing strategies I'm working on for clients out there, well, that's easy. Basecamp. I lost track of how many years I've been using Basecamp for project management and team communications. It's been around for 18 years, so that's about the time I started using it. Basecamp is all about simplicity. It's designed to give you and your team the tools you need to get work done. Messages, to-dos, file storage, chat, calendar, and more. Bring all-in-one project management to your business. There's a 30-day free trial, and you do not need a credit card to try it. So what are you waiting for? Go to jason.online slash Basecamp. That's jason.online slash Basecamp. And use the project management software they write about in books and stuff. It's great. Seriously. From zero to hero in the podcast space. Tips on how to grow your show or other audiences from Gary Arndt from Everything Everywhere Daily. He's next on Winfluence. LinkedIn believes B2B marketing can be B2 brilliant, B2 bold, and B2 breakthrough. How? With a platform purpose built to make B2B mean more for your business. A platform with tools to help you build better relationships with your key customers, to boost your buyer journey while building your brand. A platform with the trusted data and lead generation you need to beat KPIs, drive ROI, and stand out amongst the competition. And with the targeting tools on LinkedIn, you can reach your precise audience right down to their job title, company name, location, and more to make sure your ads are always being seen by those who matter. So get ready to be to boldly go where no marketers have gone before. Because LinkedIn is where B2B is everything it can be. Rethink your B2B marketing LinkedIn ads and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Gary, you are the first person to be on Winfluence twice. Until now, I haven't done return visits, but the last time we talked, you were, I think, maybe six months to a year into everything, everywhere. You shifted to building a podcast because your travel conference and travel everything got coveted, but you were seeing some great success early on. Well, now you're about to hit a milestone that's quite unusual for an independent podcaster. Tell us how the show's going. It is going really well. When I launch the show, you have certain milestones and goals that you want to achieve, but I always try not to put a date on them because sometimes you may achieve them faster. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. You don't know. But yeah, one of my goals that I did put a date on was for 2020, I wanted to get a million downloads in a month. And to put that into perspective, I was getting a little bit over 100,000 downloads a month in December of 2021. So it'd basically be a 10x increase this year. And as of right now, I'm basically doing 700,000 downloads in a month. So the show has seen a lot of growth this year and it just keeps continuing. You know, I'm setting new records for weekly and daily downloads all the time and uh, the train just keeps going. That's fantastic. And for those people out there who may not know, give us the elevator pitch on what Everything Everywhere is and what you cover. I cover everything. (laughs) I have broken every rule of podcasting that everyone says you got to niche down and then keep niching until you can't niche any further and then niche again. I was was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do a show about everything. So I basically made the show that I wanted Mm -hmm. to listen to. I'm a guy who has a wide variety of interests, very curious about things. I'll get lost for hours reading Wikipedia where you end up going from one article to the next. And it's just a very wide range of things that I'm interested in. And so I made a show that caters to that, figuring if I am interested in this stuff, someone else has got to be interested in this stuff as well. And it turns out that there are a lot of people that have wide ranging interests and are very curious people. But there's also, turns out, other benefits to doing a show like this in that basically I can do a show about anything. One of the things I have not done any shows on so far, because I'm kind of holding off, and I think maybe there's someone in your audience listening to this would be something about, say, bourbon or spirits <laughs> or the history of these certain drinks. I think I could help you there, Gary. <laughs> because, you know, I had one person that followed one one group that followed me over from the travel world, and that was the tourist office of Spain. And they were basically like, just do something about Spain. They were not picky. So I ended up I've done maybe two dozen episodes about Spain stuff. Mm-hmm. And they didn't even, they even asked me what it was. They found out the day, you know, the show came out. 
And they have just been pleased as punch because it gets people thinking about their destination in a way that's different. That it isn't, oh, come here and eat at this cafe and stay at this hotel. No, I'm telling the story of Ferdinand Magellan wasn't the first person to go around the world. He really died. And it was a Spanish guy on his ship that actually was the first person to do it. And now there's a ship named after him. And the Spanish Navy has this crew on a sailing ship that goes out. And you can actually go see it and visit it. And the people who work for the tourism board are like, we didn't know that. (laughs) And there's lots of these historical things that, and there are ways of looking at the world that people, they just didn't know that. And so it gives me opportunities to talk about things in a way that maybe are a little bit different than, you know, I bet most people, even like just to use the example, because I know of like, what is the difference between Irish whiskey, Scotch mm-hmm. whiskey, and American whiskeys? There is a difference. Most people have no idea. They don't know what it mm-hmm. is. They think it's just, well, that's made in Scotland, that's made in Ireland, this is made in America. And, and that is true, but there's also a distinction in how it's made. And most people don't know that. Or what's the difference between rum and vodka? Well, they know they're different. They taste different. But why? What? And so there's things like that in, in all areas of life that people just don't know the story behind it. And, you know, and I know that there was a great deal of demand for this based on the success of many different YouTube channels that are kind of similar, that have sort of an educational theme. And it was just a matter of time. And it's really been starting to pay off. And I should say the response I've gotten from the audience has been really overwhelming. The reviews I get are not like, oh, this is a great show. You should listen to it. It's this is the greatest podcast of all time. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. You can just literally go to my Apple podcast page and it's like, this is the goat, best Mm -hmm. of all time. Five stars, not like they really like the show. So I've tapped into something that I don't think has necessarily been tapped into in the same way. And the other thing that people seem to like is that it's not one of these NPR overproduced. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Gary. (laughs) And today we're going to be talking to a man who's been fishing for a living. And, you know, there's always some background sea music, you know, on the back or something. It's a tight show that's well-researched. And uh, I think that's what people like about it. Well, it's definitely one of the main reasons I listen to it and I like it is because it's a, it's fairly short. Your episodes are, you know, usually 10 to 15 minutes at most, you're talking about a topic, you're giving me trivial knowledge. And I think if you look at the pop culture and the people who watch Jeopardy and the people who play Trivial Pursuit and whatnot, that's your audience. It's people who love to learn something new every day. And I like the way that you, as you said, it's not overproduced. You're not producing a radio drama. You're doing a very tight, well-researched script that you're reading. And so immediately when the listener hops on, they if they've never heard it before, they can listen to it for 30 seconds and go, I trust this guy because this is factual information. I can tell it's well-researched. He's given it to me quick, easy, in a tight package. I don't have to spend 45 minutes listening to this thing, and I'm going to learn something. And that's perfect timing for commutes. It's perfect timing for if people want to listen while they go to the bathroom or walk their dog or whatever. I, I mean, you just really nailed it as you kind of planned this show from the get-go. Yeah, and there's certain things that I've discovered in the process that I didn't even know when I started. One is, and I I don't have data for this, but I have enough data points where I think it's true. People tend to listen to shorter shows first. So if you have a queue of shows and one of them is 10 minutes and another one is a two-hour interview, they'll listen to the 10-minute one first, get it out of the way because they know they probably won't get through the two-hour one regardless, you know, anyhow. And the other thing is the way I design the show is I always have like a 20 to 30 second cold open. That cold open, I can cut and paste that text. It goes into the show notes. If I post it on Facebook, that's the text I use. The audio from that, that's what I use on TikTok. And I've, I've gotten 10,000 followers on TikTok just doing that. I just take the 30 second cold mm-hmm. open, slap a vertical image on it. That vertical image is what I use for Pinterest. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I'm able to reuse all this stuff. And because I'm doing a daily show, you have to be able to, I think efficiently do a lot of this. You always hear about podcasters like, oh, I took eight hours to edit my show. It's like, that does not work. You have to publish that you have to deliver every day. And that's really the secret to doing a daily show. The perfect can be the enemy of the good. Well, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why your show has grown. I think obviously the content and the construct of the show has a lot to do with it, but I want to dig into the steps you've taken to build this sort of behemoth of a show in a relatively short amount of time, primarily Because those content creators and brands out there listening, they can take away some ideas on how they can build an audience for a podcast if that's an avenue they want to pursue. 
So outside of, you know, doing a, a show about everything so that you have this license to talk about anything you want to do, take us through the top three or four ways you've actually grown that audience. The first is the realization that a podcast is a media property, no different than the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Avengers. Obviously, the scale is different, but it's a media property. And a lot of people complain about the discoverability problem with mm -hmm. podcasts. And I have come to the conclusion there is no discoverability problem, or at least there is no, it's no different than the discoverability problem for books or the discoverability problem for movies. The Avengers, the most recent one, one of the biggest selling blockbusters of all time, had a $200 million marketing budget for a movie that everybody knew was coming out, that everyone wanted to see. They still had to spend an enormous amount of money. Book sale, and I mean, you've written several books, you've been through the process, you know what goes into it. People aren't just going to randomly walk in a bookstore and probably find it. You got to put it in front of them, and a podcast is no different. And I've invested money, quite a bit of money, and I will be investing a lot more money in the future in doing this. And I've been investing it in advertisements on podcast apps, on other podcasts, doing feed drops, things like that. And you have to go where the listeners are. And one of the things I've learned in growing a following on other social platforms like Instagram and whatnot is that you have to grow the platform on the platform. Mm -hmm. And if you want to grow a podcast, you got to do it where the podcast listeners are, which is on other podcasts or at least in podcast apps. So that's, I'd say, the biggest lesson. You have to treat it like a business. No one would open a restaurant and never, if you devote zero dollars to promotion, the odds of your success are going to be greatly diminished. And I think that's true with podcasting. There are a lot of podcasts out there, and it's very difficult for people to find you unless you get in front of them. And I've had a lot of people contact me. Yeah, I found your show through this ad I heard on this other thing. Or you just need to get them interested. And then once they're there, you get them hooked. So that's, and so many podcasters yeah. don't do that. That's very true. So let's talk about paid advertising for your show as opposed to on your show, which we can touch on that later. But because for people who know much about you before everything everywhere, you were a very successful travel journalist, blogger, photographer, podcaster. You had a nice online audience already. Mm -hmm. I know you started out in the content creator world after a successful exit from a startup back in the dot-com era. So it might be easy for someone to assume you started everything everywhere with a bankroll to invest in all this, but I don't think that's accurate, is it? This podcast? No. So I basically traveled around the world for you know, from 2007 to the pandemic, for most of that time, it was just through savings I had from selling a business and selling a house. Towards the end, I was starting to actually make a living off of it and bringing in a fair amount of income. But that all dried up when the pandemic hit. And, you know, I lost, I think I mentioned this on the last time I was on, 95% of my income in March of 2020 just vanished. And it really put me underwater. So one of the reasons I actually did a daily show is one, I had the time. And two, I just did the math. And the math is so much better. The more episodes you put out, the more ads you can put, the more opportunities for people to discover you. And uh, if I wanted to grow quickly, I knew this was probably one of the quickest paths to doing it. So that was what I did. And in figuring out how I do this, like I realized, okay, I don't have a lot of money to do a lot of these investments. So what I'll do is start the show, hustle, drum up as much support as you can, do the social media stuff. Then once money can start rolling in, take that money, use it for promotion to grow the show, which will bring in more money that you can now invest more money to and grow the show. So I've just called it like the flywheel approach. It takes a long time to get that wheel moving. But once it starts moving, you can start rotating faster and faster and faster and faster. So this summer, I have signed my first 10-figure deal for advertising on my podcast. And I've also just spent five grand on a promotion that will be running next month. It'll end just before podcast movement, which is good timing. So that's my biggest promotion that I've spent money on. And that's the plan. And, you know, my goal is to get this show to a point where it's doing 100,000 downloads per episode. Wow. And I think I can do that within two to three years. So that would be a roughly another 10x increase. But I see no reason why it can't. The audience for it is enormous. It is certainly globally. But I'm just going to have to make that investment to achieve that. But once I can get to that point, well, and I'm already noticing this right now. No one wanted to give me the time of day a year ago. And now I got podcast networks coming to me almost, you know, <laughs> a couple times a week. Oh, hey, we really love your show, you know. So it's definitely paid off. But the thing is, I treat it as a business. It's yeah. not a hobby. I also love your analysis of the cost of a subscriber. Walk us through that math again so people can see why, 
you know, a couple hundred bucks here and there can make a really big difference in the long term in, in terms of monetization. Yeah. So it's no different than, you know, your cost of a customer in, in any business. But in the case of podcasting, and I'll just use advertising as the revenue model because it makes the math easy. But if you're selling a course or, or consulting services, you can also figure it out as well. Ads are sold on a CPM basis, which is the cost per DM is per thousand. So you have to think about, and the industry average right now is about $25. Although I feel going forward, I can get much more than that. So I have 365 shows that I produce a year, and that is roughly one third of a thousand. So if you're selling for $25 CPM, that means the average subscriber who listens to all your shows in a year will be listening to a third of a CPM, which is about $8 something. That's just if I run one ad per episode for the average. That's a floor, not a ceiling. Right. So I can be sure if I can get a subscriber, that's going to be worth about $8 a year. So my cost of acquisition for a subscriber, so I started when I began buying ads, I started doing the math. I realized I can buy them for about, not buy them, but acquire them for about $1 to $2. And that's a huge yeah. arbitrage right? That's a huge difference. That, that's printing money, basically. Mm -hmm. And there's only a few indie podcasters that have figured this out. And most of them don't talk about it very much. Because I, I religiously, every day I would document, I'd go to every site that had ads that allow you to promote, and I figure out who those podcasters were. And then I did a lot of the research on the back, because there is data you can actually find on a lot of podcasts to at least get a good idea of where they're at. And I figured out what they were doing, and I copied what a lot of those people were doing and on the sites where they promoted. And so, yeah, if you know the value of a subscriber, then you can figure out if it's worthwhile to spend money on promotion to acquire those subscribers. If you have a weekly show, whereas a daily show is roughly a third of a thousand, weekly show, let's say you do 50 shows a year out of 52 weeks, you're looking at roughly 5% of a CPM. And then you can just calculate it from there. Yeah, that's good stuff. We are talking to Gary Arndt of the Everything Everywhere podcast. You should just go subscribe now if you don't already. It's a short daily dose of knowledge, a lot of history, a little dab of art and science and humanities in there too, but very little politics and brow furring to be found. So you don't have to worry about all that. When we come back, I want to ask Gary where the podcast has taken him that he didn't expect. So stay tuned. Back with Gary Art from the Everything Everywhere podcast on pace to eclipse a million downloads, not in a year, but in a month by the end of 2022. It's just a couple of years old as well. Tremendous growth for an independent show. And let's touch on that for a quick second, Gary. Your show is just you in your basement knocking out great content. You've achieved a huge number of downloads, not as part of a big podcast network or media company. That's not very common. You mentioned that some of the podcast networks have approached you probably about joining. I wonder if anybody's approached you yet and said, hey, can we buy you? <laughs> uh, no, I'm far from. The thing you have to remember is that there are many orders of magnitude difference between the very top tier podcast and the bottom. And I'm, I'm doing well, but you got to remember when you're looking at aggregate downloads, I have a daily show. So, you know, compared to a weekly show, you can multiply that by seven. I'm just now starting to get on the radar of a lot of these networks. So I still have, like I said, I, there's still room for 10 to a hundred fold growth in the show over the next yeah. several years. So there's a lot of room for growth. And maybe when something like that happens, who knows? But as of right now, I don't think anybody would find it something worth buying. And just one thing you said before the break, you said there's no politics. That's a purposeful decision that I made early on because I did an analysis of one star reviews <laughs> on a lot of podcasts. And there are two things, two things that overwhelmingly are responsible for the most one star reviews. One is that there are too many ads on a show. And the second is inserting politics when it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a political show, that's fine. Go nuts. That, that's, yep. that's what you're doing. But if you don't have a political show and you're constantly just inserting barbs about politicians or whatever in the news, you're going to be alienating about half your audience. And I purposely even stay away from mentioning things that are in the news. There's a couple times where I've had to mention uh, the war in Ukraine because I was talking about something dealing with the military. And I did an episode about uh, the James Webb telescope, which is kind of in the news and another about the volcanic eruption in Tonga. Those aren't really, you know, hot button <laughs> political issues. Those are more an explainer like, hey, this was in the news. Let me explain what really happened and, and how this worked. 
So yeah, I purposely stay away from politics. And the other thing I purposely did when I started is I decided not to use any foul language and uh, to make it as family friendly as possible, simply because there are some other podcasts I listen to that I really enjoy and they don't do that. And I could easily see over the course of years how it turned a lot of people off. You don't gain anything by being crude. So I made the decision. I was just going to keep it clean. And one of the things that ended up happening, and again, I didn't intend this, parents started listening with their kids. And my show is not for kids, right? Not in the extent that like, you know, if kids programming is, you know, Barney the dinosaur, it's not that. But kids listen because they're bright, curious kids. Yeah. You know, there's, there's no reason a kid couldn't listen to the show. And so I get parents that say that their nine-year-old, <laughs> my show is their favorite podcast. And like my show today was on Hyman Rickover and the creation of the nuclear Navy. And there's a nine-year-old kid listening about an 83-year-old admiral who was in the U.S. Navy. But, you know, if they're bright enough, they're going to at least be introduced to some of these topics that they might not have known about. And at least will be able to broaden their knowledge base of something that they probably wouldn't get in school. Well, you're feeding the hunger of the quiz bowl and academic team members of the future, which is a good thing. I was on the academic team. I would have, at nine years old, probably would have listened to your show. Good. I, you know, I tell people when they leave a review that their kids love is like, you are a good parent. (laughs) (laughs) Great. And it doesn't really surprise me. I actually had a hand in my, you know, content strategy, social media strategy days. I had a hand in developing Wonderopolis, which was a content engine for the National Center for Families Learning, NCFL, which is a literacy nonprofit. And the the goal there, the original goal of that content engine, which was basically a blog, was to give parents something to engage their children with at home to supplement classroom learning. But what ended up happening is the wonder of the day, which was kind of the concept of the content engine, that wonder of the day wound up being used by teachers in school. So it's very similar. I wonder if you've thought about yet plans to spin off something that might be more targeted for that educational use from what you're doing. I've certainly thought about targeting that market, like the homeschooling market, as in terms of, just in terms of marketing, that here's a free resource that costs you nothing that you can get your kids to listen to. And then I've also thought, well, then I could probably maybe do like a daily newsletter that could correspond to that day's episode, where it could be just here are five, here's a short quiz for retention, five things that you should have taken away from mm-hmm. this episode. So there are things that I definitely can do. And I also have had teachers say that they listen to the show in their classroom which I never expected or never even thought of when I started the show. So in fact, I, where I live right now, there's this bar I go to and one of the bartenders once a week, it's his part-time job. He teaches AP world history. And I got talking to him, you know, about all my travels and stuff. He goes, man, you should come in and talk to my class. So I'm actually going to be doing that. And I also think one of the reasons why kids are listening to it is I do not pander Mm -hmm. to them. It's not for kids or hey teens, because They hate that. They want to be dealt with as adults and with respect. And so by not pandering, you kind of make something which I think is actually they're probably going to enjoy than if you tried to make it for kids. All right. I do want to touch on monetization a little differently. We touched on advertising your show, but I want to also talk about advertising on your show. You've always run ads on your show. Some podcasters don't, and that's fine. But take us through how you approach ads with respect to the listener experience, and then tell us how you manage or handle the ads you do, because there's a dozen ways to do that, from affiliate stuff to signing up for ad networks with dynamic inserts and all that jazz. So give us the rundown on your approach to advertising. Uh, So right now I'm doing dynamic ads for everything, even if it's a host read ad. So that way you can sell a set number of downloads And most of them will probably appear on the most recent episodes. But if people are listening from the back catalog, and I get a lot of back catalog listeners, they will hear that as well. Most of my stuff right now is being handled through another network. I'm not going to say too much about that other than my contract ends at the in in December. (laughs) Um, I think there's a lot more that I could be doing. One of the things that I am doing is I'm working on a, a tour for 2023 in Rome that I hope to be announcing soon. And... There's been a lot of interest in people going on a Rome tour with me. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to. And that's a, you know, I think tours are a way that a lot of content creators, not just podcasters, 
could potentially monetize things. It doesn't even have to be a tour. It could just be some sort of in-person event that I think that's often overlooked. People are so focused on doing digital stuff like eBooks and courses that they often forget that there may be demand for in-person type things. And I think especially for what I do, the Rome tour is just going to be a deep dive into one place. Mm -hmm. And before the tour, I may be even doing some online lectures talking about some of the things that we're going to be visiting that, you know, tour companies just usually don't do because the primary focus of the tour is going to be educational. Yeah. And if this goes well, then there's no reason why I couldn't stamp these out for different cities and maybe even work with different tour guides in different places to do these kind of education focused tours, whether it's a walking tour in New York and San Francisco or, you know, whatever. Sure. That sounds great. And to give us a little bit of a callback here, I know that, you know, this is probably past for you, although you probably still have a relationship with him. I really appreciated and loved, and I'm glad you brought it up, the way that you handled the sponsorship with the tourism folks from Spain. Because when you started that, when that started up for you, that's when I was really like diving in and listening to every episode. And it was really awesome because you spent the episode educating people about something that had to do with Spain. And then in the middle of that, there was this highly relevant recent information sort of read of, hey, go to Spain.gov or whatever it was, the, the URL, so that you can learn more. And so I love the way you incorporated that. And it sounds to me like You've got almost a blueprint here if this Rome trip goes well to do what you just said, to just say, okay, then we're going to do Greece and then we're going to do China and then we're going to do Australia and then we're going to do whatever. So you've got a, a nice roadmap out there ahead of you, which is great. Yeah, I and I'm just – I'm such a convert to podcasting now. I mean, I had done a podcast for many years. I started one in 2009, but it was kind of always just a half ass thing that we did and, you know, we'd have a guest on and, you know – we chew the fat. We never made a dime off of it in yeah. over a decade. So when I started this, I, okay, I'm going to take all the stuff I learned. I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to put my head down and just focus on the show. And that's what I've been doing. I haven't traveled anywhere since this started. And I, I've, I've had opportunities, but it's like, well, if I have to miss episodes, I'd, I'd rather focus on growing the business right now than I would traveling because I've traveled quite a bit. So I'm good. Well, sure. Gary, I'm guessing there's a few folks listening who are not yet part of your subscriber base, but would like to be. Tell them where they can find the show and where they can find you on the interwebs. Wherever you are listening to this right now, just go search for everything everywhere daily and you'll find it. And what I always advise people is there's no order to the shows. Pick one you like. And if you like it, you'll listen to a hundred more. And if you don't, you won't <laughs> listen to another one. So I have a feeling a lot more people will be doing the listening to a hundred more. Well, Gary, congratulations on the success. It's great to see somebody disrupting the industry from an independent podcaster perspective. I certainly hope you continue to grow and keep crushing it, 10X and all that good stuff. I really appreciate your time and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Always good to catch up with Gary. I've had the great honor of meeting and hanging out with him at a couple of travel conferences over the years. Couldn't ask for a, a better guy to learn from, super smart, and obviously incredibly successful in the podcast space. Go check out Everything Everywhere Daily. Search for that wherever you get your podcasts. Gary's also very open and answers a lot of questions online, so find him on the Twitters and things. We'll put all the links in the show notes, of course. And I want to make sure that you are making a date for me, not with me, for me, a date with one of your friends or colleagues to talk about Winfluence. Let them know about this show. It's a handy podcast listen for those who want to know more about Influence and Influence Marketing. Share this episode or a link to winfluencepod.com with them with a recommendation. Or drop Winfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We are on them all. Join my Influence Marketing newsletter sent every four to six weeks or so, just so it doesn't jam up your inbox. Go to jason.online slash subscribe and get on that list. And I'd love for you to help make a future episode of Winfluence awesome. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you want my answer to or take on. Send me an email, jason at jasonfalls.com. If you're feeling adventurous, record a voice memo on your phone. Email me that file, and I'll just use the recording to let you ask the question right here on the show using your very own voice. Regardless of how you ask it, I may use your comment on a future episode or your question to inspire a show topic. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the Book as a thank you. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. 
While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. And if you need help with your influence marketing strategy, drop me a line at jason at jasonfalls.com. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. This is a great show. I know. We've really got some competition out there. Hello there, podcast listener. Hey, if you want another great show to listen to that tackles hot topics in marketing, social media, public relations, and corporate communication, well, then we'd love it if you added Hanson and Hunt to your list of favorite podcasts. I'm Eric Hanson. And I'm Kevin Hunt. And we are Hanson and Hunt. And just like this show, we are part of the Marketing Podcast Network. So check us out sometime.